I certainly hope this little incident hasn't put you off flying, miss. Statistically speaking, of course, it's still the safest way to travel. Let's go. But inconspicuously. Through the window. And here we go. What is up, everyone? Welcome to DC Standom, your guided tour of the DC multiverse. It's been a while, but I'm your host, Mike Chikini, the editor-in-chief at DennyGeek.com. And each week, I'm bringing you discussions with writers, artists, actors, and experts covering everything from DC Comics to the movies and TV that make up the DCU. But it's a comics episode this week, and it is a big one because it is my absolute pleasure to be coming to you live because I've got one of my favorite writers ever, and a man who is more in tune with the spirit of the DC universe than just about anybody. I've got Mr. Mark Wade here with us live today. Mark, say hello to everybody. Good evening, sir. How are you this evening? Great to see you. I've been reading your books for as long as I can remember. This is the first time we've ever spoken, so I'm just thrilled to have you here. I'm happy to be here. The first issue of Mark and artist Dan Moore's new Shazam series is out today. And folks, I said I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It is the single best Shazam comic in about 25 years or more. So you should definitely pick it up. Wade and Moore's ongoing Batman Superman World's Finest series is pretty much the platonic ideal of what you want from DC superheroes as well. And we're going to talk about all of it today as well as some exciting new projects on the horizon. Right, Mark? Am I right in saying all this? That is correct, sir. All right, good. But before we get into all this good stuff, you should know that this episode of DC Standom is presented by DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Outright Games and Warner Brothers are calling DC fans of all ages to unite against chaos in the all-new open-world action-adventure game DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Designed to be fun for the whole family, you can play as Batman, Superman, or Wonder Woman to battle the mischievous Mr. Mixus Pitalik, who has summoned Starro the Conqueror and other supervillains to keep the Justice League busy while he becomes the new self-appointed mayor of Happy Harbor. There's other DC heroes in this one, too. Players can also interact with Justice League members like Green Lantern, Cyborg, The Flash, and Aquaman, who all make cameos throughout the game. You can enjoy DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos with friends and family in two-player instant action couch co-op to engage with the exciting and hilarious gameplay. Justice League Cosmic Chaos is available to play now on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, Xbox XS, and Steam. For more information, head to OutrightGames.com and follow Outright Games on Twitter Instagram, and TikTok for all the latest updates and information on Justice League Cosmic Chaos. And yes, video games are a blast, but let's talk about some comics, shall we? Mark, I feel like we should start with Shazam because it's out today. Uh, It's the first issue, and it's a pretty momentous one. Uh, I personally can't really say enough good things about this but i feel like you've had a shazam story in you for a long time that you've wanted to tell why don't you tell us how this came about and how bringing dan mora onto this book came about too it's been you know a bucket list item forever i don't i'm I'm not had a story in my back pocket but i've had some concepts and i've had some thoughts about billy who he is how you know how he works and the family and so forth and editor Paul Kaminsky knew this and suggested some time ago that Dan and I might want to you know, do a little side project here or there. Maybe I mean, it's basically it was, we were just doing it off the books and it's kind of we'll use these pages somewhere down the road. And then at some point with the success of World's Finest, I guess, uh, they realized they had something here. And Dan was great enough to sign on board for a full time second book because he's that He's that fast. He can do two books a month. And his interpretation of that character is so amazing. It's so good. And, yeah. you know, we're going to talk about Dan a lot today because yeah. as we, as we should. Yes. It's so funny how 
his style walks the line between, you know, it doesn't feel like he's doing whimsy, you know, even as there's like whimsical elements in this story, you know, just as world's finest, when there are horrific elements or surreal elements, they are disturbing. But the rest of the time, it is this very straightforward heroic book. And just as like Superman looks like a leading man in world's finest, the captain looks kind of like rosy cheeked and like this character looked for so many decades in the past. I can't believe how faithful Dan is to the spirit of the character and the look of the character. One of the, one of the things no one has noticed except me is on that first issue cover, you know, he's bursting out of pages of Shazam from years of, of old. And I assumed that they were just stats of the original, you know, comic book. And then I saw something that didn't look quite right. And I went back and did a comparison and no, he redrew, he redrew every single, so every image on this page came from Dan's pen. None of it is, is like a pickup art from an old comic. He just recreated this stuff and made it look terrific. He has a way of being able to draw anything from any period in DC history and make it look contemporary and make it look modern. And that is the secret of all of this. He is the secret sauce. I can't believe that he drew all of those background images. I just assumed they were, you know, that they were reprints or whatever. Like that's unbelievable. Yeah, I did, I did too. And then I, yeah. And then I saw one of the panels and I thought, well, that's not right. Kid Eternity's been in that panel. Why is there that come from? So I went and looked, <laughs> I went and found that panel for him. And I'm still looking for the, for the, for the, one of the other panels on the page. I'll find it eventually one of these days. This has a very classic Shazam feel to it. Um, you know, I do feel, look, there have been good Shazam comics pretty much always, okay? But I feel like so many modern Shazam stories have struggled with the essence of the character. This just leans into it. There's like no apologies whatsoever for what kind of you feel that spirit of the character is. So what... What do you think makes up an essential Shazam story? Like, what were the bits that you knew you had to get into this book? I Just the general tongue-in-cheek nature of it and being unafraid to commit to the whimsy of it and the fact that it can be a funny book as well as, as we'll see in this issue and on, com and on you know, coming issues coming up, a very, a very startling and, and very shocking book too. We liked, I like moving up and down the tone but I, uh, the secret really is just settling back into the basic concept. Kid says a magic word, becomes a superhero. There's a talking tiger. You know, there's there's gods. There's magic. There's a sense of of fun to it. And I understand why so many people in the past 20, 30 years have been afraid of leaning into that because the mar <laughs> nothing in the comics market suggests that there is a place for this. Uh, every you know the, the fear of oh gosh people won't take it seriously and it's not grim and gritty enough. I understand why people feel that way, but I felt like it was time to roll the dice and if I'm going to do it, fully commit. I mean, you fully commit to the point where we even for the first time in over a decade now kind of give him a name like he's supposed to have with uh, with the, with the captain. Yeah. So was that a tough sell? You know, that's like, that's like kind of been a third rail with this character for a while. Right? It has been, it wasn't a tough sell only because it's really sort of informal in the comics. I mean, it's not like you're going to see merchandise with the captain as, as a logo on the character on a beach towel. But I just, I was very uncomfortable with him being called Shazam because then he can't say his own name out loud. And if he can, and you set up a situation by which, oh, sometimes the word works and sometimes it doesn't, then to me, that takes all the magic out of the concept and out of the word. It's not a magic word anymore. So obviously, you know, the original name, Captain Marvel, off the table. Uh, another name, Captain Thunder, another one we bandied about, also off the table because of other trademarks from other companies. This was, this was our compromise. And is it a little generic? Uh, yes. If anybody has any better ideas that are legally sound, I'm all ears. I, look, for years, I have been wondering, why don't they just go with Captain Thunder? And I would have thought that that one Bronze Age Superman story 
would have locked up the Captain Thunder name. I guess not. Some, nope. Somebody, somebody's got the trademark right now, and it's not us. So, um, but the captain works. The captain works just fine. It's like it's like Doctor Who. Yeah. You know, he doesn't call himself Doctor Who. He's just the Doctor. He's the captain. Yeah. And people call I him like that. Captain. That's a good so, yeah, yeah. That's that's really where the idea came from. Yeah. How far ahead are you planned on this book? Gosh, I issue six, seven, eight, somewhere along in there. I mean, you know, it's an ongoing, so we're good to go as long as people are buying the book. But we've, you know, I, I've got a big list. I, when I started World's Finest, I made a giant wish list of all the characters in the DC universe that I would love to touch upon in World's Finest. And some of them were sillier than others, and some of them were a little more whimsical than others. It's kind of hard to fit Batmite into world's finest as we're setting it up now. But I went through the list and was able to pull out, oh, well, a tattooed man is not much of a menace for Superman and Batman, but hey, that might be a good Shazam story. So going through the list, there's so many characters that I can play with and you'll see so many. I mean, like I think I mentioned before we went on the air, we got uh, Gorilla City coming up in issue three. Uh, we have Gargawak, the emperor of the moon from Doom Patrol showing up in issue four. Uh, one of my favorite things to do overall, and you've seen it World's Finest, is have characters pairing up that you've never seen pair up before, right? I mean, Cap has an interesting world, ro Rogue's Gallery, and we'll get to that. We'll get to Mr. Mind. We'll get to Savannah. But right now, I'm really interested in, okay, what is it like to have him fight, you know, Luther or whatever? So, you know, some character that he, we don't normally see him fight. This is a perfect way to get into World's Finest because you talked about having a wish list. Yeah. And like, it's like you start burning through that wish list in the very first issue. I mean, like the first issue alone, there's Metallo, there's Poison Ivy, there's Zod Non and Ursa, there's Luther in his 80s power suit, there's Red Kryptonite, there's all of these concepts that all of them in isolation, any of them can work and any of them are great, right? I can't remember the last time I've seen them all together in something that wasn't explicitly some kind of like big event book where it's like, and now they're all together. So everything's going to be different here. It's just like, no, this is the DC universe folks. Like, that's, exa that's exactly up. it. The reason the doom patrol is in those first few issues is because we have never seen Batman and the doom patrol have an adventure together in 60 years of doom patrol. So I thought it's overdue. I want to know what your kind of, I don't know if, if like remit is the right word or mission statement is the right word. But with World's Finest, you know, you're telling stories that are, you know, I guess, you know, in continuity. I like I know continuity is like a stumbling block for whatever. We'll get to that. But, you know, these are set a few years in the past at a time when you're able to tell characters in kind of their most iconic versions. Right. So was that part of what drew you to the book? I mean, it feels like it had been a while since you had done a DC ongoing as as well so how how important was that element of it like to draw you back in that was an, a, a huge important element and it's not because i have an affinity for older comics silver age bronze age and stuff like that i do but those comics exist they have a place this is not an attempt to recreate that stuff but the beauty of being able to step back a few years is that we are not beholden to what is happening in the Superman books right this second, what's happening in the Batman books right this second, trying to get all those things coordinated so that it's all one seamless present day DC universe. This gives us a chance to sort of form our own little pocket so that we can set things up that will spill over into the main DC universe. And we're going to do that with every arc as near as I can, as near as I can plan uh, to make it, clear that it's set in the past but it is connected and there is a reason for you to read this book because there are origins here of things that will be big in the dc universe in 2023 and 2024 like i had no idea i read batman versus robin late okay like full disclosure folks i did not read batman versus robin until i was prepping for this interview and what a mistake that was because you know, the, 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 was a Mahmoud Azrar on that book? Yeah. Like, like, it was fantastic as well. But I love that, you know, the first arc of World's Finest is completely standalone on its own. 
But if you read that, it enriches everything that happens in Batman versus Robin, which, of course, then sets up Lazarus Planet and which is, you know, setting new status quo in the DCU. So you're kind of getting to play with all the toys, even even if you're very firmly like, you know, I feel in your wheelhouse with World's Finest and Shazam. Yeah, I feel, I, it's the best of every world for me. I get to write in that era. I get to write as you say, the classic versions of the characters, the iconic versions that we're all familiar with. But the key to making it a book that still matters, if you will, even though it sets it takes place in the, in the past, is that we are setting things up for the main DC universe. And that's part of the goal of every arc, to be a standalone, but have threads that can then spill out into Shazam, spill out into other books, spill out you know, throughout the DC universe. When you were first brought back for World's Finest, at what point did Dan Mora come into the picture? Because this book is great, but it's just it's just greater because it's, it's Dan Mora. It, Dan is Dan is amazing. One of my favorite things about Dan, besides his storytelling, besides the fact that the pages are beautiful and impactful, is that. I will often send him reference on Bronze Age stuff that, you know, suits, costumes, characters, or whatever, and tell him, look, some of this stuff looks a little outdated. Feel free to punch it up. Feel free to muck around with it a little bit and, and do what you need. And every time it comes back just exactly the way it used to look, and yet it somehow has some sort of Dan Moore touch on it that makes it look like the now, makes it look contemporary. It's amazing. His Batman is just unreal. Just the little detail of like, it's the Batman 89 movie logo on the chest. You know, like it's it's the the way the utility belt looks. It's the lines on that Robin costume are unbelievable. <laughs> like it just, like it's definitely pushing all of my buttons as a kid who grew up in the 80s and had superpowers action figures. But it also feels completely contemporary. Right, that's the goal. That's the goal. And, and without Dan, I don't know where I'd be on that. And Tamara Bond villain, we should mention, is the colorist there. And with Shazam, Alejandro Sanchez, colorist, who also makes Dan look really good. So uh, it's a team effort. I mean, it's I've made it clear all along. This is not, you know, they're not, I don't want to work with an art robot. I want to work with somebody who's going to be an actual participant in the storytelling and bring their own heat. And all the people on these teams do this. Does any of this change your tone? Like as you're getting pages back, you know, do you start thinking about how, you know, that might impact future issues? Like, are you then changing, um, I don't know, just the way you want to present certain characters, especially as you're bringing in new folks, like when the key and the Joker show up, it's just, it's right. just out of control. Yeah. Sometimes I'll see characters that Dan just thrown in there and I will say, okay, he really needs to draw a firestorm more or what have you. I mean, it's just, it's, it's always a pleasant surprise to see him take on any of the DC characters and villains because there's something about the way he interprets all of them that you want to use all of them. You know, Hypertime, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it wasn't particularly well received at the time. Oh, there, that's, that's a way of putting it. Yes. Um, it, but now, <laughs> like it's kind of it's time has come right it seems am, like I'm, it's almost by default even before this book has kind of just kind of crept into storytelling is like the natural logic of everything and not to break my arm and pat myself on the back but i think if you look at my history of, in comics you'll see that there have been many times i've been ahead of my time and doing, doing stuff that nobody was paying attention to but then a little while later hey this actually there's something here and that's kind of flattering, actually. It's, it's nice to feel like you've done something, contributed something to the DC universe or to your favorite characters that gets carried on by other people. It has legs. It feels like you've actually added something to the mythos. And Hypertime was a really good example of that. It wasn't terribly well received at the time, but now, yeah, it's the foundation of a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm not sure I could even explain Hypertime, you know, it's, but it's I just... really It's really simple. Everything happened. That's somewhere out yeah. there. Everything happened. That's all it is. It's basically just okay. 
you know, a way, a, another way of framing parallel worlds. It is the thing that all of the stories you ever read in DC history happen somewhere, someplace, sometime. That's all, that's all hyper time ever was. Well, it's working now. And like, I feel like World's Finest is a book that just kind of, even without it being articulated, is just like applying that hyper time logic because it is like just the, the perfect versions of all these characters. I know we only have another couple minutes with you, so I kind of want to do a lightning round, if that's okay. Let's do it. Is there a DC work that you are most proud of? It's a tie between Kingdom Come and Birthright. I am Superman Birthright is maybe one of my favorite things I ever wrote. I know that your upcoming Superman work is going to potentially call back to elements of Birthright. Is that correct? That's correct. Superman, The Last Days of Lex Luthor, which is sort of a semi-sequel to Birthright. It's not, you know, you don't have to read one to read the other. It's not necessarily a continuance of the story, but it's the interpretation of Luther, the interpretation of Superman that you see in Last Days of Lex Luthor. If you read Birthright, that'll be very familiar to you. You have done two Legion reboots, um, right? The, yes. Three, I, counting, three counting being the editor of the five years later, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but five years later, is like that's like a soft reboot, right? But like you've done two back-to-the-start Legion reboots. Yep. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite between the two of them, or is that like picking your favorite child? No, my favorite is the is the more recent one, the two thousand five one with Barry Kitson. That was that really felt like we were able to get under the hood and really take that book and that mythos apart and put it back together in a way that was respectful but was very modern. And I I'm very happy with the way it turned out. I mean, it lasted a good long time by you know current comic standards. And I, you know, as, as interesting as the Archie Legion was, is what the other thing was, the reboot before that, I'm much happier with this. I Look, I love them both. I feel like the later one would have been even more successful. I think it was, I think it, once again, I think you were ahead of your time on that. I think the radicalism of that one would have landed even better five or six years later. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I do think it tonally and with the things we were dealing with sociologically, I think we were ahead of our time. Yeah. Like I revisited that, you know, at the start of the, uh, <clears throat> the bad years right. uh, and <laughs> like, and it, and it hit different. Like it really yeah. hit different. I mean, like I always enjoyed it. You can't go wrong with Barry Kitts and art. Right. Um, right. No, of course. Yeah. But the revolutionary spirit of that book, uh, I think, I think people, are just like primed to rediscover. I, I don't know. I don't know why they haven't already. What are your memories? Because one of my favorite, most treasured single issues of all time mm -hmm. is the Flash 50th anniversary special. Uh, That's nice. Like that just, yeah. Like that was before I knew who you were. You know what I mean? Like that was probably, might've been the first thing of yours I ever read, but it was just something that when it came out, it just felt like this amazing thing that was just kind of mine you know where do you do you do you have particularly fond memories of that do you think you know john fox is a character that needs to come back i'm really curious just about yeah about this yeah. story i mean it just means a lot to me personally it, the reason it worked is because it wasn't an assignment i mean it, it was but it wasn't it felt like an assignment it was we have to pour one out for editor brian augustine my late friend who passed away last year and he, he was the editor of Flash and the guiding light of Flash at that time. He loved the Flash. I loved the Flash. So it was an anniversary issue done by people who really, really, really loved that, that character. And we had Bill Lobes. We had uh, Len Trzewski. It was a good team on that book. You're known as a Wally writer, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like you did that amazing run on Wally. Do you have a Barry run in you? God, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I I took a bite of that apple with Brave and Bold, Flash and Green Lantern, back with which I love Barry Kitson back in the day, back in, in some time ago, which is still in print, by the way. All this stuff's still in print, by the way. Go to your local comic store. Um, I I probably do, but uh, it'll be a while before we get around to that. Well, folks, that is it for this week's DC Standup. We will be back soon. I promise. I don't know that we'll have a guest as cool as Mark Wade but I'll see what no. I can do. 
Don't forget to check out our web home, DennyGeek.com. You find all our DC coverage at DennyGeek.com slash DC. Drop us a line on Twitter and Instagram. We are at DC Standom. Let us know what you want to hear about in upcoming episodes. Uh, give us a follow. You know the drill. And thanks again to our sponsor, Outright Games and Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Head over to OutrightGames.com for more info on that fun new game. Don't forget to check out our Marvel show. This Friday, we're doing a live stream about the amazing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And uh, I think that's it for this episode. But this has been DC Standom on the Denny Network. Until next time, remember, folks... We stand together. <laughs>